Okay, the talk today is on broadband policy in Australia and the economic trade-offs and tensions about it. There's been a lot said. There are proposals on the table by both political parties. There's posturing going on in the private sector. And broadband has obviously become a hot topic. What I want to do is untangle the web of it today and look at some of the economic tensions and suggest appropriate principles for a way forward. What's the state of play? Well, the good news is we have plans to roll out basic broadband with speeds in, in excess of 256 kilobytes a second pretty much across the whole country. The issues now relate to the next wave, the next step up, what we call high-speed broadband, with speeds in excess of 8 megabits a second. Now, we already have this available for a lot of businesses, especially throughout our capital city CBDs, and we also have it in some local areas through Big Pond Cable Extreme and also ADSL2, where of course it's switched on. This is the graph, the waterfall graph that gets shown everywhere and generates emotion regarding where Australia is currently lying in terms of broadband penetration. This is the number of total number of subscribers as a proportion of population. And you can see Australia is right here below mid range, but you know, alongside the United States, for instance, which suggests that our broadband penetration is not too bad. But that masks a separate picture, which is generated by this graph, the real emotive graph. This is the graph that talks about average broadband speeds, megabits a second, for various OECD and other countries. You can see at the top there are South Korea and Japan, who have broadband speeds of 100 megabits a second, so industry, the benchmark. Singapore uh, are behind, but actually have plans to move all the way up there and beyond. And other countries have certain blocks. Of course, Australia lies here. Okay. Right down at below one megabit a second. And even that is generous in many, in many respects. So despite having uh, mid-range broadband penetration, the service that Australians are getting is nowhere near, in terms of potential speed, what exists elsewhere. What does it mean to be a technological laggard? Well, there are risks and rewards. Start with the risks, which is what a lot of people focus on. By being behind, we risk a few things. We risk, first of all, restricted communications. Not having enough capacity means less information is going to be able to flow. And with less information in terms of sheer data, we're probably going to have limited access to knowledge as well. And then finally, of course, there are lost opportunities for applications that would rely on higher bandwidth that we just simply can't get with lower bandwidth. But there's an upside as well. By being behind, we get to wait and see. We get to see what applications are developed. We get to match our needs to those applications later on when we see them developed. And we get to buy equipment, not when everybody else is investing, when prices are sky high, but later on down the track when things are cheaper. So we might get the same infrastructure for far less cost if we wait a little. In terms of current plans, the current proposals that are being put forward, the dream is to actually get this. Applications in e-health, for instance. Here's a nice picture of a surgeon sitting in a major capital city, operating remotely on someone in a regional area. Okay, the idea of bringing expertise where it currently isn't and doing so cost effectively is the promise of e-health. E-education, same principle. Here we have a picture of an expert lecturing uh, somewhere to a whole classroom full of children and even potentially more than what's just been shown there. And being interactive as well, being able to field questions 
deal with uh, uh, particular issues and basically teach, but teach remotely. Video conferencing. This is the big hope for being able to avoid business related air travel. Being able to have conferencing, be able to have meetings, not just domestically, but internationally as well. All comes from having higher speed broadband. Then of course, hear a lot about video downloads. This is the stuff that people experience right now, it takes a lot of time. Being able to watch download movies, watch television over the internet and things like that. And then finally, there are games. Basically, having a high speed broadband connection will allow you to have more graphically intense games played over the internet. At the moment, the focus is, of course, not on those final applications, they're sort of to come later, but on actually getting the infrastructure up so that they're available. This is the vision. Now, interestingly, I'm already there. In my uh, house uh, in Melbourne, I have Big Pond Cable Extreme. And if you look here, the download speed is 20 megabits a second. Okay, possibly the, one of the highest residential internet connections in the country. The upload speed, 240 kilobits a second, much, much slower. But this is what is being currently proposed that we invest to get to. So I'm right there. And so I have particular experience in being able to speak to what that is going to entail. The one thing, interesting thing it entails is this is very nice when I'm surfing a website that happens to be only a few kilometers away. But what happens when I access something internationally? This is the reality. Accessing a website in New York, notice that my upload speed is about the same. My download speed's back at the one megabit a second. Okay. Back at the speed that I would be able to achieve with a basic broadband internet connection. In other words, all those upgrades, faster internet connections locally, not faster globally. But that's going to matter in terms of the value of this. Now let's step back a second and just think about where the bottlenecks are. So here's a stylized diagram, computer to cable modem. Cable modem is linked in through, say, a cable connection or through a copper pair to the node. Node is, a, you know, at a, a corner or end of a block. Then we have them from the node to the exchange. More copper running there, or we could have cable as well. And then the exchange, through various means, takes you to either local sites or to overseas sites. Everything we're talking about in terms of investment is focusing here, between the node and the exchange. Taking those copper pairs out there and upgrading it to op optical fiber. But immediately, once we look at that, you see the problem here. This is a whole pathway here, and we're just focusing on one bit. One thing we're missing is, of course, the thing I just pointed out to you, bandwidth out of Australia, across the Pacific for the most part. Without our further investment there, the investment between the node and the exchange will not nearly have its full value. And then, of course, there's the other issue, which is, of course, people's computers. In order to have the highest, take advantage of the highest speed bandwidth, you have to have a computer like mine that is top of the line, that has graphic cards and interfaces, uh, and, uh, and also has a home networking system that can accommodate it all. Without that, you also will face constraints, no matter how solid your interconnect connection is outside of the home. Finally, we have the economic issue. And the economic issue is sitting here and here to some extent. We have a single provider. Single provider means high prices. 